Okay, we're happens. live now. Um, uh, hello and welcome to the uh, Harassus uh, Visual Arts panel on modernizing postmodernism. Um, I'm the session moderator, Richard Vine, senior editor at Art in America magazine in New York, um, which is a 110 year old publication, which despite its title um, is global in its coverage. Um, our participants include three artists and two critic scholars, uh, all US based, but operating with a worldwide purview. Uh, I'll introduce each of them in turn when they make their individual presentations, uh, following which we'll have an open discussion among ourselves and with anyone else who cares to participate via the chat room. Essentially, uh, we're going to be considering how not only art making, but the entire art system, the schools, galleries, auction houses, museums, social media, critical and scholarly outlets, is likely to respond to the uh, potentially transformative conditions that prevail today. Um, among those factors are the lingering pandemic, global warming, a reversion to fierce nationalism and nativism, which is very much on our minds this morning, a uh, relentless mass immigration, an obscene degree of economic inequity, precedented levels of digital surveillance and profiling, and simultaneously an uncompromising push for racial equality and social justice. So in what ways will such global currents affect artists' relationship to art and art's relationship to the rest of us? How can one best create and appreciate visual art in the years ahead. Be before we jump to the future, I just want to take a minute to look back and remind ourselves what modernism and postmodernism were and what they contributed to aesthetic and social development. Briefly, <laughs> I'd suggest that modernism, the art mode that dominated for about 100 years, roughly from 1870 to 1970, posited a per perpetual innovation and progress led by an avant-garde composed of individual culture heroes or geniuses who define the ever-changing cutting edge. But eventually, prompted in part by the Vietnam War, the Black Liberation Movement, and an overwhelming upsurge of consumerism and popular culture, Critics in the last third of the 20th century came to feel that though much had changed on the cultural surface, little or nothing had changed fundamentally. Ezra Pound's famous 1934 dictum, Make It New, had essentially failed. Postmodernism, in reaction, declared an end to all such grand narratives, although that is ironically itself a grand narrative statement. Um, and concentrated instead on contingency and interdependence. This fresh sensibility expressed itself in multiculturalism, historical pastiche, media analysis, and the unmasking of biases, largely white, Western, middle-class, heterosexual, male, which were said to insidiously maintain themselves under the guise of quality and expertise. Today we're awash in new, widely distributed social artistic possibilities, including artificial intelligence, biological manipulation, blockchain registers, cyborg technology, genetic engineering, NFTs, and the hyper interconnectedness of information systems. So, like you, I'm very eager to hear what our panelists think about such tools and such potential weapons and how they will be deployed in the 21st century and to what artistic, social, and moral ends. So with that, I'd like to start uh, with one of our artists, Janet Esch Eschelman, is uh, a sculptor and fiber artist who creates immense sculptural environments that were originally inspired by fishing nets but carry many implications for our now globally interconnected world. 
Janet graduated from Harvard and has taught at Princeton and other top level institutions. Her TED talk, Taking Imagination Seriously, has accrued over 2 million views. So Janet, if you would take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you today. When we talk about the changes happening in art from my own practice, Imagine yourself lying on the street in the middle of London at Oxford Circus on the cold asphalt in January looking up. The mayor has stopped all traffic on Oxford and Regent Streets and made the tube station exit only because there's so many people and they're concerned about trampling underneath an artwork that strings together between buildings a form. And that form is changing with colored light ever so slowly as the people beneath are selecting colors that express their mood at the moment, like a giant mood ring for the city. These installations that I'm creating are frequently in unexpected places like the street, the city, underneath highways, connecting between buildings over uh, parks and Courts, uh, using our world as the mooring for a new kind of art experience that brings us together, that, that invites strangers to begin to talk to one another and to interpret and create meaning in their own way. Um, engaging with issues that are central to our lives at this moment in time with our planet. Um, they are physical manifestations uh, when any one physical point in this sculpture, which might span one, two, or even three city blocks, moves every other node uh, in this physical sculptural uh, interjection into the city, every other move is influenced by any single uh, change. The wind is an actor. People are actors. We are all interconnected in this uh, experience. Um, and I would say that in the context that Richard just outlined for us beautifully, um, this is my response as an individual practitioner, as an artist, to engage with life today and really prioritizing the individual's experience, um, which does not require uh, pre-existing references, uh, the way that much of postmodernism required. Uh, any person can have a direct experience with this art. Hmm. Great. Thank you so much. How's that? Okay. <laughs> uh, it's always great to bring things down to the specifics and the concrete, and uh, I'm sure there'll be questions as we come back around. Um, our next speaker is Boris Gross, uh, professor at New York University and the author most recently of In the Flow, Logic of the Collection. He is known internationally for his work, uh, including more than a dozen books on media theory, socialism and art, and postmodernism. Uh, maybe a particular note today in this kind of new Cold War moment is his 1982 study, The Total Art of Stalinism. Uh, which views the totalitarian, totalitarian state as kind of a totally encompassing work of art. Uh, mm. Boris? <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's over. And the return to it is impossible, of course. Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, the experience now... Uh, second wave of uh, globalization. So first wave of globalization that was postmodernism. And I remember this period uh, very well. Mm, everybody was speaking about the infinite play of signifiers, uh, infinite flows of information, immateriality. Uh, one had a feeling to be overwhelmed uh, but this new globalized world and kind of lost uh, in, the, in the flows of science, yeah, that the new, uh, that this globalization produced. 
Um, the artists and theoreticians, also very famous French theoreticians, reflected this kind of feeling of freedom of science uh, that uh, kind of separates us for the context and for the identities. And now I would say we have a return uh, of the science to identities and the return of the science to the context. Um, the use of the signifiers at that time was very frivolous and ironic. And today is a very serious matter. If you begin to use the signs that uh, belong to a different identity or to a different context, it is a serious matter. You take a certain kind of responsibility, also ethical and political responsibility. That, I would say, is one important change. This uh, new feeling of science as representing something and every use of them as a kind of intrusion uh, into identity and context uh, they belong to. And the second one is that the technological aspect of um, a new wave of uh, globalization became more obvious. Uh, there is, especially in the new generation, a kind of neo-avant-garde feeling, people begin to experiment with uh, artificial intelligence and today notions like post-humanism and transhumanism uh, began to be uh, very fashionable, uh, signifying actually the loss of the human identity. So on the one hand, people speak about identity, uh, on the other hand, they don't want even to be humans. Yeah, They want to lose even human identity and some kind of realm of pure energy, pure feeling, pure uh, thinking. So we have uh, indeed a certain kind of a return uh, to, uh, to modernism in terms of a return of a representation of function of science, but also a return of certain kind of futuristic drive, uh, almost irrational uh, movement uh, towards something that is universal, abstract, non-human. Uh, that that we find uh, already at the end of the 20s, beginnings of the 30s, in a kind of second phase of European avant-garde. Well, that's kind of general theoretical right. remark, what happened. Thank you so much. Uh, next we have uh, Damien Ellis, the son, grandson of painters, uh, is a British-born artist with studios in Los Angeles and the Colombian rainforest. Uh, although he made his start as a graffiti artist in New York, he is probably best known today for his series of representational paintings of the working spaces of modernist masters, including Monet, Matisse, Picasso, Kahlo, and O'Keeffe. Damien? Okay. Um, I'm not sure I have a lot to say about the fate of postmodernism, um, <laughs> but life did lead me to making paintings about global warming in the 1990s. And so I'm going to talk about my experience with that. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, yeah, as you mentioned, my father and grandfather were both artists, so I was exposed to art at a very early age. I didn't visit their studios very often, but when I did, it was very memorable. And um, I even remember my father once letting me paint in the sky behind one of his subjects, which was quite exciting. Um, so I, they both died when I was 15, left me all of their brushes and their easel, all of their equipment. And I turned away from painting at that point and went to college in America. I went, also went to Harvard. And um, uh, at the, I did playwriting there. At the end of four years, my brother gave me as a parting gift a, a palette knife that had belonged to Henri Matisse who had given it to Alice B. Toklas, who had given it to my professor. My professor thought I should own it. 
And I said, what? You don't like my story? You don't like my playwriting? And he said, no, I love your storytelling, Damien, but all your stories are about an artist who hasn't quite found their thing. I said, oh, painting, really? I went off to New York and the first, uh, well, I met Keith Herring there very quickly and Keith Herring encouraged me to start painting. And very soon I was exhibiting with um, with uh, Robert Fraser in London. Uh, he put me in a show with Basquiat actually at the Edinburgh Festival and my paintings beside Basquiat, which was a pretty amazing start. But, but uh, later I went to Colombia and... Uh, began making paintings uh, inspired by Monet, really. I began joining paintings together to make huge panoramas that people could walk around inside in, and see threatened rainforest, cloud forest, that kind of thing. Um, one of the, the last paintings that I made in Colombia was about global warming. It was a huge floor painting, um, which from wall to wall in the galleries, and um, people could walk around and see the, this cloud forest below their feet. And in the middle, they could find the, a source of the Amazon River, or they could not find it. Um, and that, that actual source in southern Colombia was on the top of a volcano. By a freak of nature, it had ended up on the top of a volcano. Um, and the volcano was active and exploded every few years, killing this beautiful cloud forest, this ecosystem around the, around the source. And um, so I gave people that experience. And what I found was that in the 90s, people enjoyed walking through colorful artificial landscapes, but they really didn't, weren't that interested in any kind of messages about global warming or um, the destruction of the rainforest or uh, all of the things that we do worry about right now. Um, but during the time that I was in Colombia, uh, the internet had emerged. When we were living down there, we had to begin with at least no phones, no TV, no, no, definitely no computers because there was no internet. But so I returned to Los Angeles in 2000 and immediately bought a computer. And the first thing that I Googled was Picasso's Bateau Lavoie studio. It's the place when I lived in Paris years before, it's the place that I had tried to visit um, unsuccessfully, like most tourists had found that it burned down in the 70s. And, but I, when I Googled it, seven little pictures came up and I couldn't make head or tail of his studio until I noticed one of the, ha the arms of the demoiselle in one photograph and an arm of another demoiselle in another photograph. So I printed out Demoiselle d'Avignon and all, all of a sudden I could make a jigsaw puzzle and see what his studio looked like a hundred years ago. That's when I decided to change tact. And instead of thinking about how we are destroying the world at every turn, I decided to focus on... Um, what we're doing right, because humans, we are highly creative problem solvers. And, um, and an artist studio is a, is a metaphor for all that we're capable of. So at the beginning of this first lockdown um, that we had, I had an exhibition opening at Unit London. I'd worked for about 18 months on all the paintings. And now it seemed that nobody was going to be able to visit the show. And that, in fact, that's kind of what happened. Nobody was able to go there on foot and see the actual paintings. But the gallery did a really good job, the unit, and they managed to get the whole show out there virtually. And um, there was a captive audience because everybody, all of us were trapped in our homes. And I think also that when people feeling trapped in their homes, saw paintings of the studios and what these artists were able to, to create uh, in their own little confined spaces was kind of hit a nerve. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our, our next speaker is Lance Espelin, uh, who is the art critic for the Wall Street Journal and formerly the U.S. art critic for Bloomberg News and the chief art critic for the New York Sun. He's also the author of The Art of Looking, How to Read Modern and Contemporary Art. 
Thank you, Richard. Um, we're all coming at these topics from different perspectives. And I kind of wanted to shift our attention a little bit to some of the dangers that I see going on right now in the art world. Um, I was trained in practice as a painter before I became an art critic. So I come to this panel on behalf of art and artists first and everything else second. Um, I believe that art exists for its own sake, that art is as much in dialogue with art as it is with its public. I believe that art is a poetic expression, a transformation of an artist's experience of the world, that art deals with universals regarding the human condition, that a work of art either matters to know or if it is good, relevant, matters to everyone everywhere, regardless of when or where or about what or by whom it was made. I don't adhere to the idea that artists have obligations to address so-called contemporary issues or to nurture the world's woes. An artist's only job, as I see it, is to pursue the true and honest path um, his or her art takes to the best of his or her abilities. And it's the job of arts institutions to support and honor artists they can find, not to control them or to dictate to them. I'm also aware that one might rightly ask with the state of the world today, with the doomsday clock at 100 seconds to midnight, if it's important to be discussing art at all. I don't mean to be alarmist, but I would advocate that our world of culture, the climate of art, is in crisis, that art is facing its own clear and present danger, um, that this is exactly the time to sit up and take notice. Cultural institutions, especially art schools, foundations, and museums, are increasingly losing their nerve and sense of mission. They're undergoing an identity crisis in which the tail is wagging the dog. That tail includes the art market and auction houses, the greater public and its desire for entertainment, community outreach, fluff, spectacle, Van Gogh immersions, and so-called relevant contemporary art that mimics and mirrors uh, the public itself. It includes the woke mob, cancel culture, the runaway train of technology, and the belief that the art of the past is increasingly useless to us and that the art of the present is all that matters, all that's accessible and meaningful. That tale also includes divisive politics right now um, from the extreme left, which favors identity politics and is attempting to turn art and artists into propagandistic arm of social justice. And the right, which at, it, at its extreme abhors, abhors almost everything the avant-garde has created since 1913. Um, this toxic environment encourages everything but art and artists. It's a climate in which art is being made not by artists, but by committee. And certainly there are exceptions to the rule. Um, last week, Tristan Hunt, the director of the Victorian Albert Museum, was quoted in the London Times. To my mind, Hunt, there is a powerful shift within the museum profession from a world of connoisseurship based around the design, significance, and craftsmanship of the object to a much stronger belief in museums as agents of social justice and community transformation. The trend, of course, is nothing new. In his recent book, Authority and Freedom, A Defense of the Arts, the art critic Jed Pearl quotes from a 1956 letter written by the novelist and short story writer Flannery O'Connor. O'Connor was a serious Catholic, and her friend, Father James McCown, recommended she read a novel with a Christian moral subject. O'Connor, to McCown's surprise, hated the book. She explained that, quote, the novel is an art form, and when you use it for anything other than art, you pervert it. She went on, quote, art is wholly concerned with the good of that which it is made. It has no utilitarian end. If you do manage to use it successfully for social, religious, or other purposes, it is because you make it art first. She told McCown that the novel he had recommended, quote, is just propaganda, and it's being propaganda for the side of the angels only makes it worse. Thank you. All right, you have a challenge. Tiffany, our final <laughs> Tiffany Schlein, uh, is an artist and Emmy-nominated filmmaker and the author of the national bestseller 24-6, giving up screens one day a week to get more time, creativity, and connection which won the Marshall McLuhan Outstanding Book Award. Tiffany? Um, it's great to be here. Uh, and I like to take the long view. I mean, 
we have just experienced a pandemic. Hopefully we're on the other side. But if you go way back, and in most of my filmmaking, I love to kind of place it in history. If you go back to the bubonic plague, all of that death and destruction eventually gave way to the Renaissance. And it was almost like it took such a, a radical thing to happen to society to create a new way of thinking. And then if you look to the 1918 um, Spanish flu, uh, there was so much death and destruction there, but women finally got the right to vote shortly afterwards. And then if you look at COVID today, I'm always looking for what's going to come out of this. What are the silver linings and are going to come out of this period that was um, incredibly difficult for a lot of people? And I think you see, first of all, as someone that, um, you know, founded the Webby Awards, I was interested that the web was finally used as this global collaborative tool for scientific breakthrough. Uh, I think that we saw um, and see today people really questioning work, which I think is really interesting in the way we work. And then lastly, most importantly, um, people ask very big questions, which I think a lot of art comes from, which is um, what's the meaning of life? And these bigger, what do I want to do? Where do I want to live? Um, what do I want to create? And these are really big, profound questions that everyone was kind of forced to think about deeply as death was all around us, and especially in that first period when we really were scared to go outside. And um, I think that as an artist that has worked in film and, and books and now visual art, I'm always looking for... <laughs> creative constraints i love creative constraints and covid was like the ultimate creative constraint it was like you can't move you cannot go anywhere or if you do and the only place i left was my house and i would go on the mountain and i have to tell you right before covid i had been working so hard on what i call the spoken cinema show that premiered at moma in new york on february 15 2020 and me and my team had been like focus, focus. It was like the dream moment. I had been working so hard for it. We got the premiere. I'm so grateful. And I thought, I'm going to take this on tour. That's going to be the next two years of my life. And then um, COVID happened and I was in this cre new creative constraint and um, started spending a lot of time on Mount Tam near where I live in California. And I completely started doing a different form of art. And I was trying to art articulate in these photographs and sculptures and sculptures and film this sense of humility I felt from COVID and um, this sense of asking these bigger questions and understanding um, <laughs> you know humans are always trying to center themselves as this powerful entity and I think COVID was real intellectual humility and um, I found it really a profound period um, to rethink a lot of the big questions so I know me personally, now I just started an artist in residency doing visual art, which is so different than I thought I was going to be doing, so, which I kind of love how unexpected it was. And I'm very excited to see what comes out of this last year's because we're just about to see all the exhibits and the books and the films and the that comes out of this very unusual period we just went through. So um, while my heart is extremely heavy as a Ukrainian Jew about Ukraine right now, um, I'm also hopeful um, for what is going to come out this intellectual and kind of profound period that the world just went through. Wow. Um, I think uh, Lance has really given us all a, a challenge and uh, maybe I'd like to throw out to the group the, the, the question of if indeed this is happening, and I, and I think it is, that there's this major shift from Connor's on the shore ship, excuse me, to um, kind of popularism and social consciousness. Um, what what caused that shift and where is it leading? If anyone would like to weigh in on that. <laughs> well, I could elaborate a little more, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, I, I think that as soon as, um, I mean, I think it's been going on since Manet probably, if you look historically, you know, he was the first painter to challenge uh, a, a lot of things and kind of put the idea of challenge out there as a notion. And then, you know, through Duchamp and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I also think that with identity politics, we've shifted to a position where we're 
we're talking about the subject matter and the people who made the work and the um, everything outside of the work itself, instead of thinking about the artwork as a as something that lives autonomously from the artist. And because we're connecting the the bio of the artist or the subject of the artist work so so important as giving it so much importance, I think that this is where we've led. And I think that in that sense, um, you know, we've gotten away from the idea of art. I think I think we shouldn't be surprised. You know, I think that when we get something like um, Norman Rockwell and motorcycles in the Guggenheim, we shouldn't be surprised that we have a reality TV star as the president of the United States. I think that the shift away from um, everything or the shift to everything but what makes a great work of art is what's put us kind of in the position where we are, where we're, we're kind of in a topsy-turvy world. Anyway, that's... Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, we put the greatest nonsense in the world inside the White House yeah. <laughs> um, because we've made everything about, everything is about me, 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 whether it's through social justice or through, um, or through uh, social media or through, I mean, I think there's a whole shift in the world that's happened. And I, you know, I'm looking, you know, here I'm making the grand narrative statements, but <laughs> I'm looking at it kind of from a, from this perspective, um, trying to make, make sense of it. Well, I don't know, anyone else? Well, yeah, maybe I, maybe I say something. You know, well, it seems to me, I agree, yeah. But it seems to me that it has to do with the medium internet and the media world in general that we're living in. So uh, early art spaces were very much separated from other spaces, uh, from, uh, from the political space of self-presentation and so on and so on. Now we are using the internet we're going into the internet and asking for the name of the artist. Yeah, we immediately get uh, 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 biographical information, all the scandals he or she was involved in, and also then uh, the artwork. Yeah, so we get this all in a packet and we can't dissociate it. Yeah, it what we learn immediately and at the same time. And the same uh, in general, yeah, when you're reading, uh, I don't know, classical art theory, it is based on the difference between image and text. And now image and text are put in the same medium. uh, Both of them are digitalized. And uh, every uh, Facebook, every Facebook, uh, site looks like uh, installation of several art of the 70s and 80s. You have text, you have images, photographs, by information, information about the surrounding, you have videos, you have maybe films here. Yeah. So we have a kind of unification and homogenization of a space of representation. An artist uh, became a part of it. And so it's a very difficult to separate the artwork for all this mass of images and information that we are in. That is why this neo-avant-garde uh, drive I was thinking about uh, kind of tries to thematize this and to go with a kind of new kind of technophilia that we didn't uh, experience from the 30s, I would say. Does that mean that we're we're entering into a sort of direct democracy regarding culture? That um, instead of having the representative model that we had in the past, where you had experts and gatekeepers like curators and critics and scholars, um, all of that is sort of set to one side, and there's a a kind of direct popular vote about <laughs> um, what art is interesting to us at this moment. It seems to me that people just lose the interest for arts, yeah? Mm. Um, the mainstream is not... The mainstream cannot be shocked anymore, yeah? Um, by anything, by any image, any form. And so the people began to think 
that it's irrelevant. Well, I mean, I sp I don't know what there's a sound and I'm hearing something. I don't yeah, know if somebody wants to go on mute. <laughs> um, torturing a child. Yeah, if you can go on mute if they're not That's speaking, small. I think that'll solve that issue. Um, I guess, you know, I wrote a book about the fact that my family and I turn off all screens one day a week and have 13 years. And it's in those days that are like... I get perspective and I get a sense, you know, I turn off the network and those are always where my creative ideas come from. Like I, 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 my most creative ideas happen on the day without screens. And I think about that a lot because we're so bombarded and jacked into the network every second. And like on this dopamine treadmill of stressful news and email and notifications and texts. And how can you even have a thought? How can you have any perspective? And it's only when I turn off the screens, which I'm about to do tonight, um, Friday night to Saturday night, that I can think. And I think about that because I, how does anyone have perspective of what's happening? So that's like a bigger philosophical thing about the internet. I, I mean, obviously I, I love it, I hate it, but thank God we had it during the pandemic. And also um, I think that I think people need to get off it more <laughs> in general. So I think everything that you were saying, um, I think people are losing their own sense of what they're thinking because they're, they are so influenced by everyone else. And, and I worry that we ha don't have the time to kind of think what we're thinking, which I think is what you're speaking to Lance also is like this kind of mob kind of group think and, um, and I just, I enjoy my brain so much more and my creative mind on, on my days without screen. So I think that's what I'll add. But Janet, your, your work kind of presents this interconnectedness in a positive light, if I'm reading it correctly. Is that true? I would say yes. That's not to oppose what Tiffany is talking about, about like humanly cutting off from, you know, your mm -hmm. cell phone. Uh, yeah. But this is more about our interconnectedness to all things. Um, and Lance, I mean, I, I was listening intently as you spoke and thinking about, well, hey, what about like Robert Rauschenberg, who, who for me opened up what materials for art could be? Or, you know, like this ever widening um, set of what subjects for art could be, uh, you know, and as Damien talked about Matisse. Um, you know, I would hate to think that that is some kind of a, a, a straight line to a reality TV show person, uh, becoming the president of this country. Although look in Ukraine, there's been quite an inspiring leader, uh, in that country who played a president on TV and then became one. So, um, perhaps it's not the process or the method, but more, the character of each individual. That's a great, that's a great link. That is like He's two opposite narcissist. scenarios and they both are super weird and narcissist. surreal, but opposite. And yet, <laughs> yes, um, you know, uh, there. I remember the years where I pretended that Martin Sheen was my president. Um, <laughs> uh, and I understand that the president at the time who shall not be named was in fact uh, made sure that Martin Sheen would never be in the same room. Um, at the time, at, like seriously. Um, uh, and I will note that um, on the comment of Ukraine, like another element of my work is their ability to embrace the moment. And right now, last night, we were out programming um, new colors of light for uh, a 600 foot sculpture of mine called uh, titled uh, Bending Arc. And uh, this is on the waterfront in Florida on a, an important civil rights site uh, where the first swim-ins that integrated public beaches and pools uh, occurred. And uh, we are turning it yellow and blue uh, right now to show solidarity with Ukraine. Um, you know, it's very rare and in very, very special circumstances will I uh, adjust my work and the colors are integral to the work. But in this case, um, we felt it was important. Uh, and this is like the art is serving 
sometimes the artworks come to take on additional roles. And, and Lance, this may be in contradiction to what you're saying of, of leaving art to be pure and pristine, fine art, high art. I mean, uh, if you go to Portugal, where my my work in Porto has been there, you know, almost a couple decades, like it's the symbol of the city. Now you go to the football stadium and it's the symbol of the city and the place and it's part of identity. Um, like sometimes these works, you know, the artist doesn't control them. They become part of culture, oh, no, think, part of life. Um, I think and, they should have lives of their own. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. I think art should have a life of its own and, and go into the community and be, be whatever it needs to be and evolve as the, as people evolve. Um, my, my, what I was stressing was that we don't just make socialist realism and um, yes. that, that we, that, that it has to be art first. You know, that's why I use the O'Connor quote that it can do every art, art is, has an infinite amount of power. And if it's alive, it lives like we live. That's how I see it mm -hmm. and um, evolves as we evolve with it. And so, um, yeah, I was just stressing the idea that, uh, I think too much right now is is being forced into this category of of having to have a cause, having to make a point, having to have a moral um, yes. uh, message, and not being and and the artists are being forced into this. I really see it in terms of how many exhibitions are being curated right now about social justice. We're doing a climate change show, or we're doing this, or we're you know CAA didn't even wouldn't even allow anything that wasn't social justice related last year mm -hmm. for its panels. It's just like it's a, um, it, it, you know, mm -hmm. my own experience as an artist, that's not how I, you know, it was about that experience in the studio. And then if, if a subject came out of that, mm -hmm. that was, um, you know, about global warming or whatever, it came, it evolved naturally out of the experience mm -hmm. of making the art, not that it was forced on, you know, that it was pushed right. into it, like, you know, a square mm. peg in a round hole, so to speak. Anyway. Yeah, and I think... Thank I you for that clarification. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's the way, actually, I, t mm -hmm. I took it. I, I mean, I think there's room for both. I mean, Janet and I connected a long time ago. I made a lot of films about interdependence, and her work is about interdependence. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, right now, this new body work is more about isolation because that's what it felt like on mm -hmm. some level for me over this last two years and this kind of humility. But I, I guess I love when you're when you're living in the world and hopefully you have time to turn off the screens and have time for reflection and think your own thoughts see what's in there see what your response is that as an artist you're processing the world you're you're experiencing it all and what comes out of you can be completely unexpected it can be it can be political i mean i've done a lot of women's rights films because i get so frustrated and my channel is to make a film about it um and so i think it's about i think what I agree with you're saying, Lance, is that you need to just be speaking to your own inner tune. And that's the art should come from that. And sometimes it might be political. Sometimes it might just be art for art. It might just be mm -hmm. an object yeah. and that there, there's space for all of that. Right. And you may not know what it is about. Totally. Until long after you've created it. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know. For sure. Um, so... Or it may become, as you were saying, Janet, a, a, a symbol for the city, um, which was not intended necessarily. But, hey, that's the power of art. You know. Well, it is interesting to, to oh, right, do we need to wrap up? Richard, yeah. I, I pass it over. Quickly, yeah. quickly, you can say something. We have like 30 seconds. <laughs> um. I'm enjoying being open to the meanings and uses that people take my art. Uh, and it is not, it's frequently not my intention, but yet the work I mentioned in Portugal, not only is the, the symbol in the football stadium of place, but like the underclass, uh, 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 many different groups own it as their own identity. And that fascinates me. Um, we, we are, uh, but I am, I am supporting Lance's statement that it, it would be terrible to be told as an artist to do those things, but it is a liberation to see the world take and use art as it needs. So to you, Richard. Thank you very much. I think that's a wonderful mm -hmm. summary, actually. And our time is mm -hmm. up. 
So I'd like to thank all of the panelists and, and uh, Frank, the organizer of this wonderful event, um, for what I think has been a really stimulating 45 minutes this morning. Uh, thank you all. And next time. Right. Thank you very much. Bye uh, bye. Yeah. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Bye, guys. That, that has been the pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.